peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, one of my favorite characters in a book and in a movie of all times is Samwise Gamgee uh, from the Lord of the Rings, if you don't know. Sam is probably the most, not the most impressive character. He's a simple hobbit which means that he's smaller and weaker than pretty much everyone else in the story. Sam is the gardener and the friend of the main character, Frodo, but he's more than that. What I love most about Sam is that he's loyal. Sam is fiercely uh, committed to the main character in the story, Frodo. He doesn't always know what he should do or say, but he knows where he should be by his master, Frodo. He's by Frodo's side, even when he's not technically supposed to be there. He is, we might say, Frodo's right-hand rabbit. Well, loyalty and a servant's heart and humility are certainly worthy of Christian imitation, whether or not you like Samwise Gamgee. In fact, those are things that Luther, Martin Luther is getting at when he gives us the definition for following the first commandment. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We learn a lot of different things in in confirmation class, but servitude, loyalty, and humility are the most truly Christian attributes. Now, Jesus certainly far surpasses any character, and he gives us a surprising example, if we're not paying attention, of a humility, a servant's heart, and loyalty to Yahweh, specifically to his Father. Well, today is, we rejoice because it's uh, Confirmation Sunday, and we rejoice that Jacob Whitman is being confirmed, and that two other students, Senna and Matty, have also completed their confirmation classes, and will be doing something in their church service. It's also, as we mentioned before, Trinity Sunday, which means that we focus on how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together for our salvation. And the key concept that shows up in Peter's sermon today has particularly to do with Jesus and the Father. Jesus is the right-hand man of God the Father. You probably know what a a right-hand man, a right-hand woman is, someone who can be completely counted on to do what uh, whoever their superior is, to do exactly what the superior wants. To, If you are the superior, a right-hand woman, a right-hand man is someone you can trust to carry out tasks even when you're not there. Well, Peter explains to uh, a wondering crowd at Pentecost what's going on and who Jesus was. Now, this is Pentecost, which means it's one of the, the three pilgrimage festivals. So there's lots of visitors in Jerusalem, which explains why there's so many people speaking so many different languages gathered at this time. But even though there were lots of visitors to Jerusalem, probably most of them were already aware of Jesus, because Jesus was clearly the biggest news story of the year in Jerusalem. Plus, some of the people who had traveled to Jerusalem at Pentecost had also traveled to Jerusalem at the last pilgrimage festival, which was the Passover. And what had taken place the last time many of them had visited during that Passover? Well, Jesus had been tried publicly, or tried and publicly crucified. And uh, my point is this, at least some of the listeners, visitors listening to Peter at Pentecost, had also been listening to Pilate at the Passover. And they had gone home, many of them, in the meantime, but now they were back. And some had probably witnessed a variety of different things, or maybe even been caught up in the fervor of the moment, calling out, crucify him. And so this crowd is probably already intrigued by more info about Jesus, and some of them perhaps are feeling a little bit ashamed of themselves and how they had acted. Peter, though, will make matters much worse for their guilty conscience. It's bad enough, right, to kill a wise man or a moral teacher 
who espouses nonviolence and positive change. But who was this man they had killed? Well, Peter's answer is that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was, in fact, the right-hand man of God. Jesus was not just an innocent man. Jesus was not only a good man. Jesus was God's right-hand man sent to redeem and rule Israel. He was a man whom God had trusted and appointed to rule, just like King David before him, which was exactly what the people were saying they were hoping for. Jesus was, in fact, this promised Messiah. The many miracles, Peter says, wonders and signs that God performed, as you yourselves know, through Jesus right in the middle of God's people was clear proof that he was not just any man, as even Nicodemus, a man of the Sanhedrin, says. But you shut out the truth, and you delivered Jesus to be killed by lawless men, the, the, the Gentiles, the Romans, who don't have the Torah, the law. This was God's right-hand man. And yet, God's people had rejected his message of reconciliation, and they'd preferred revenge, power, and bitterness. However, since this was God's right-hand man, God had not abandoned him, and even death could not stop him. Israel had rejected Jesus as its rightful ruler, so what did God do? God decided instead to make Jesus the ruler, not just over Israel, but over the entire world. The ascension meant that Jesus was raised up to rule at the right hand of the Father. Now, Jesus was not publicly performing miracles anymore, even if there were, I'm sure, rumors of his appearances uh, as secret appearances floating around. I mean, if social media had been around in that day, you can rest assured it would have been full of all kinds of stories, cobbling together different facts and presenting theories as to why they believe Jesus was dead or alive or a ghost or what the apostles will, were still doing in a town that had rejected and killed their leader. But the question that everyone, believers, doubters, and haters all alike were asking was, if Jesus is alive, why isn't he showing up anymore? And the answer is, that Peter gives, is he's ascended. He's moved on. He's finished what he came to earth to do, and now, you might say, he's been promoted to rule the heavens and the earth. It's very simple. Jesus isn't here anymore. Why? Not because he doesn't have, not because he can't be, but because he's got somewhere more important to be. Jesus has been raised to rule at the right hand of the Father. Now, now Jesus is not just the right hand man of God. He's ruling at the right hand of God. And Peter says, again, listening to the crowds uh, who have taken part perhaps in Jesus' death, he says, the man you opposed as Israel's anointed, has instead been anointed to rule over the world. And now, this is normally the moment in the story where the enemies of God would be overcome and destroyed. After all, what had they done? They'd not just, they'd not just been slow of heart to believe, they'd actually rejected and killed God's right-hand man, the Messiah. They had been in God's way, actively opposing the very hero sent to them and savior of God. But shockingly, these people are not destroyed. The point of Peter's sermon and of Jesus' crucifixion, we can see, not just for them, but for us, was not simply to execute justice on those who unjustly executed Jesus. The point was so that the world which had so vehemently called for Jesus' death might be given life. God didn't want to overcome his enemies. Rather, he wanted his enemies to be overcome with remorse and to cry out to him for the forgiveness that they needed even before this. Which is why Peter's call for repentance and invitation to the guilty parties to be baptized into Jesus for their salvation is met with, uh, with over 3,000 people repenting and accepting this gracious offer. Jesus still is at the right hand, and he is, we might say, the right-hand man of God, although that's not all he is. But 
it's important as we think about in Jesus' ascension, or maybe a better way for us to think about it is, why is Jesus not here? Because we ask that question a lot. Why isn't God doing something? Well, the point is that Jesus' ascension is not about escaping his enemies, but about ruling over creation. So Jesus is doing something. It's not the same, well, it's the same sorts of things, but he is now ruling the heavens and the earth. In the Psalms, David prophesies about this several times, and, and he said to Yahweh, to my Lord, that his Lord would sit at God's right hand. And David certainly never rose and ascended into heaven to rule at God's right hand, but that is the story that Peter is telling about Jesus, which makes Jesus far greater than David. In fact, he is, as David said, David's Lord. Um, the Jewish people had wanted David to return, but what they got was something even better. They got the Lord and King of David. The clear implication of this is that all the people, all those faithful followers of Yahweh, should faithfully follow Jesus as Lord as well. Now, return to our, our concept. We talked about uh, Jesus being a right-hand man, and a right-hand man is someone a leader can rely on and even deputize to act on their behalf. And the whole story of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Peter tells us here, is proof that, that God not only declared Jesus innocent of guilt, but he declared him to be Lord of the whole world and God's own right-hand man. And God the Father, as we can read about in various places, including John's Gospel, has deputized Jesus to act on his behalf. Which, another way of saying that is that if we want to know what God is like, we simply look at Jesus. What kind of policies he enacts, what kinds of things he does, the things he says, if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. And that's the simple the simple story of the Trinity broken down. We know who God is through Jesus. Someone becomes a, a right-hand man because, right, the manager or the boss or the coach or whoever sees how they operate and they approve of it. They like it. Jesus' ascension was proof, once again, that Yahweh had given Jesus his stamp of approval. And, and how about for you and me? What does that mean? There's two Simple but important things that this can mean for our life as Christians. First of all, Jesus gives us an example to follow. There's, there's a lot of different things that people in the world aim for, but we, um, but our lives, our, our congregation, our, our churches, should not be about power or getting what we want or advancing in this world, but about loyalty to God service to others, and humbly listening to our Heavenly Father. That's what Christians, that's what churches ought to be in the business of doing. And Jesus teaches us. We see his example, and we uh, see an example of the same, and we want to emulate, at least to some small degree, the same sort of extreme loyalty, service, and love towards others, uh, and especially all those things towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the second thing we learn is that nothing new here, but we can trust Jesus. And we see yet another way in which we know that we can trust Jesus. We can trust Jesus because, shoot, even the Heavenly Father, even our Father trusts Jesus. And if the Father trusts Jesus, well, we can certainly trust him as well. We can also trust him, of course, because he laid down his life. His life was about those things that we talked about, about humility, and, and loyalty to Yahweh's plan and serving others in love. I can't really think of any three more important traits I'd like to have in my leader than those traits. Um, even though we know that we fall short and we sin daily, we thank God that Jesus is those things, that he is extremely loyal to you and me despite our shortcomings, and that he continues to serve us in a variety of ways and to serve us in this very meal and we know that his love continues to us in this life and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.